Good evening, everybody. Thank you so much for joining us this evening. I'm Cecily Cullen. I am the director and curator at the Center for Visual Art, Metropolitan State University of Denver. I'm assuming you can hear me. Um, <laughs> hope that's working out. Um, so anyway, thank you for joining us. Uh, this is our fourth and final event in our series of virtual artist talks. So we're thrilled to have four more of the Art Knots artists joining us tonight. Um, I just want to give a reminder that you keep your microphones and cameras muted to reduce distractions. Um, tonight's discussion will center on four artists' response to the idea of borders and walls. This discussion must begin by acknowledging that we are meeting and live and thrive on the unceded territory of the Ute, Arapaho, and Cheyenne tribes. We acknowledge this land to draw attention to the indigenous people of this place and their struggle. So as I mentioned, we will hear from four artists this evening, all who are members of the artist collective, The Art Knots. And they each are represented in our current exhibition, The Walls Between Us. Uh, this exhibition features 38 Art Knots members responding to the theme of walls by exploring emotional barriers, political borders, physical structures, and implied boundaries that permeate our lives. This exhibition will be on view at CVA through October 17th, so we hope you get a chance to come down and see it in person. Um, if you aren't familiar, the Center for Visual Art is the off-campus gallery of Metropolitan State University of Denver. We present ex exhibitions year round that have both local significance and global reach. Our goal is to promote dialogue with visitors, whether in person or online about the difficult issues of our day through the catalyzing lens of contemporary art. We are supported by donations and memberships. I hope you will consider becoming a member and we will put a link to our website in the chat. The Art Knots is an artist collective that uses the visual arts as a tool for addressing global issues while connecting with artists from around the world. The name derives from combining the words art and astronaut as a way to describe the process of exploring uncharted territory in the world at large. You can learn more about the Art Knots at their website, artknots.org, which we will also put in the chat. Um, speaking of which, if you have any questions for the speakers tonight, please type your question into the conversation box and I will read them to the artists at the end of each of their 15 minute talks. And then we could also address questions after all four speakers have concluded if there are unanswered questions. So with that, it is my pleasure to introduce our first speaker of the evening, Sandy Lane. Sandy serves as associate professor and studio program and drawing coordinator at Metropolitan State University of Denver. She received her BFA in 1995 and an MFA in 1998, both from the University of Colorado at Boulder. Uh, Sandy Lane is an interdisciplinary artist exploring both traditional and experimental media, as well as two and three dimensional works and installation. Her artwork examines the power of the story and how it affects culture, as well as the social mores it defines. The concept dictates the direction of her process and the media is incorporated through its execution. She exhibits nationally as well as internationally. So with that, I would love to welcome Sandy Lane. Sandy, if you could turn on your camera and your microphone. Hi, Hi Cecily. Thank you so much. Yeah. Hi, great mm -hmm. to see you. Good to see you too. Are you ready for me? Oops. We are ready, so please okay. take it away. Okay, so um, uh, Jenna, if you could uh, bring up my uh, PowerPoint. Okay, great, thank you. So this is just an overview of um, the four images that are there. I'm going to try to kind of speed through this because I've heard from a lot of people that 
Um, they don't know who the people are. And I was planning on including text, but ran out of time. So I do realize that that's an important part of this. Um, I'd just like to say a few things beforehand, and that is how important Art Knots has been to me. And um, I've traveled a few places with Art Knots, and my last trip was to Palestine, which was um, a, a very important educational and emotional experience for me, and it did um, impact this work and also another presentation that I gave at CU Boulder um, with Suzy Suzanne Mitchell, who's also an Art Knots member. Um, so my main focus is going to be going through each one and kind of explaining the characters in this. But to start off with, I'll tell you a little bit, just a little background that happens in the first piece in um, Art of the Deal and um, my experience in Palestine and uh, uh, seeing the um, occupation wall. And at the time that I was there, um, what was really dominating the space that I saw in Bethlehem was um, 14 gigantic murals, each taking up at least four planks of cement slabs that are about nine feet wide. Um, of uh, Lush Sucks. Uh, he is a Western artist from Australia, and um, I've done quite a bit of research about him, and um, he tends to be, he's provocative and um, tends to uh, 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 approach um, uh, the alt-right and has been accused of that on the wall by Palestinians. I've read several articles where they interviewed the youth of Palestine um, graffiti artists who one one was female and one was male who uh, painted over his murals. So that is happening in um, the, the, the first one. So Jenna, if you want to go to the um, art of the deal, the first one. Okay, so from the left is um, Mohammed bin Salman. He's the Saudi prince. He is behind Jared Kushner, who, and they're over on the left, both of them. And, um, and then in front of Jared is uh, uh, Netanyahu, and he is engaged in a conversation with Abdul Fattah El Sisi, who is the Egyptian prime minister. Uh, Trump once referred to him as his favorite dictator. However, these were all chosen because these are all of Trump's favorite um, dictators and uh, his daughter. Um, and this, the background happens to be um, at uh, the Durrell um, uh, Resort uh, golf course. And the background are two images that are um, on the left and the right are of Lush Sucks's images. And in the center is a picture of a post of Lush Sucks, who he um, does a lot of interaction with uh, his viewers, his audience on Twitter and various other social media, um, where he is uh, provoking um, uh, um, alt-right, propaganda. So um, this is called the T-Pose. It's actually originated from a video game, which has to do with um, uh, just a, a, a glitch within a video game. But it, it's, uh, it's actually then been adopted by the alt-right, and it is a, um, a racist symbol. And he's posted it several times. I've read several of his posts, different, different poses of this where he acts is this er, where he asks is this racist so then um next to or behind el Sisi is kim jong yoon engaged in a conversation with uh vladimir putin and then um is ivanka trump and uh, and uh donald trump um all of my inspiration has come from a lot of research and a lot of articles. However, I have also um, embellished slightly with my interpretation of it. Then below um, Trump is um, Erdogan, uh, uh, the uh, president of Turkey. Above him is President Xi of um, 
of uh, China. And then on the very, very right is um, uh, President Rodrigo uh, Duterte uh, of the Philippines. So, um, Jenna, you can go on to the next one, which is intelligence. And this is uh, the the background is a view of um, the inside of a ballroom at Mar-a-Lago. Um, uh, the top is a, 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 an image from um, Pizzagate, which was a conspiracy theory that happened and, and was a big meme. So all of this is also, I'm playing off of memes um, and all the literature that I've read. And so uh, Pizzagate was big in um, 2000, the 2016 election. It was a conspiracy theory about uh, sexual abuse um, uh, and uh, human trafficking of, of youth. And that has evolved into QAnon. The next image in the top is a uh, Marquis de Sade. The next image is um, Epstein, vi Epstein Barr virus, which was uh, alluded to or brought up in several articles that I read um, about uh, Bill, Bill Barr and Jeffrey Epstein and their connections. So Bill Barr and then the next one, sorry. So the next image at the top is um, Milo Yiannopoulos. He's already um, kind of gone from the political spotlight for uh, one of his transgressions. And um, and then the one on the right is of the um, of Jeffrey Epstein's um, uh, getaway palace location. And so on the left is uh, Bill Barr, who is the attorney general. Um, he's also had a long history in politics, served in the uh, um, Bush administration. Next is Ken Starr, who uh, also um, represented Jeffrey Epstein, but also he was the one in the 90s who was responsible for um, but, uh, the impeachment trials of Clinton. Uh, Jeffrey Epstein is next to Bill Barr, or, or I mean next to Ken Starr. Behind him is Mohammed bin Salman, who also had a close relationship with Jeffrey Epstein. Jeffrey Epstein flew his, his jet many times to visit um, uh, Mohammed bin Al uh, Salman, who um, he actually did during the election of 2016. Next is Alan Dershowitz, who is the lawyer, was, was the lawyer for um, O.J. Simpson, but he was also the lawyer for Jeffrey Epstein and then also served as, the law, uh, as one of the lawyers in the impeachment trial for Trump. Behind Trump, um, is uh, Prince Andrew, who is in trouble for being connected with Jeffrey Epstein and um, sexual abuse with, uh, he's been accused by one of Jeffrey Epstein's uh, young girls at the time under age of um, sexual uh, misconduct, sexual abuse. Next is Lex Wexner, who is the uh, the founder and the head of um, of Victoria's Secrets, the Limited. He had a very close relationship with Jeffrey Epstein, and um, they uh, he, he we don't know exactly what the situation is for sure with all of that, but. Um, he was his only client at one time. The only record of business that Jeffrey Epstein had was working for Lex Wexner. Um, he also posed as an agent, uh, Epstein, and uh, with Les Wexner, only Les Wexner didn't know it, recruiting models supposedly for Lex Wexner. Below that um is the next one is Ghislaine uh, Maxwell who's uh, was supposed to be his girlfriend and connected um with organizing uh the um organization that Epstein had um behind him is e Ehud Barak who um in the I I think it was early 2000s late 19 1990s who was the um 
uh, Prime Minister of Israel. He also had a close relationship and is accused of uh, sexual misconduct with Epstein and was in business for multi-million dollars with um, Epstein. Then is Clinton, who says he only took four trips um, with Epstein on his jets, but uh, they have records of dozens of logs on the jet. And then next is Alex Acosta, who was, um, I'm blanking his, his, I'm blanking right now, sorry, what his um, title was, but he had to resign. He was secretary, I can't remember, sorry, secretary of, and uh, in, in the, the latest administration had to resign in, in 2019 um, of, because of his uh, uh, position and the trial, how the trial ended with Epstein in, um, uh, in I think it was like 2006. Um, and he had a, uh, his sentence was, was very uh, lenient. So that is it for that one. Can we move on to the next one? Which, Jenna, could you switch to Intel? Uh, oh, you did. I'm sorry. So the next one is, this is um, the Emperor Summoned His Motley Crew. Um, the background images have to do with the alt-right, um, some of their uh, code language um, and icons. Um, Fight Club and The Matrix are two of their idols. Uh, the matrix uh, for, they, they call it red pilling. It's similar to the liberals and saying woke. And so red pilling means you're getting the truth. Um, the trolls in the background are just about trolling. Um, and then uh, the figures are uh, James O'Keefe to the left. And um, James O'Keefe is the founder of uh, project uh, Veritas, and this was this this piece is in reaction to last summer, 2019, and uh, Trump called a social media summit at the at the White House, and these were some of the characters that appeared. Um, and Project Veritas is a video production designed to punk liberals and had to call in. Yes. mainstream media. I'm name? sorry. Yeah. Oh, I missed that. Um, yeah. 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 Alex, the Only next one is Alex. Uh, Ali, uh, Ali, uh, um, Alexander. And Alex, Al, Ali, Al, Alexander was suspended from Twitter in 2019. And he was, he's also known for accusing Kamala Harris last year of not being black enough. Um, Matt Getz is next down towards the bottom, and he's a congressman, um, appears frequently on conservative radio. Up above is Ryan um, Fournier. Ryan Fournier is a co-founder of Students for Trump, which was created in 2015, establishing hundreds of chapters with the universities, with universities across the U.S., Next is Joy um, Villa, and Joy Villa is known for her um, elaborate uh, costumes um, that are all uh, all about um, uh, the, the the Trump campaign and um, supporting Trump, and uh, she is also a singer um, and has made. Uh, recently made a single called Make America Great Again. Um, ben Shapiro is next to her. He has the Ben Shapiro Show, which is a conservative political podcast and radio show. Uh, and then Bill Mitchell is next to him, also a conservative radio host and conspiracy theorist and promotes um, QAnon. Jim Hoft is below that. Jim Hoft is founder of Gateway Pundit, which is a far-right opinion blog known for promoting conspiracy. The um, blank person, the, the shadow person, 
is um, he went out for a long time, considered himself anonymous, posed himself as that. His name is what he went by his, his alias is Carpe Adunctum. And his real name is Logan Cook, and he lives in Kansas. He's a stay-at-home father. He's one of Trump's very favorite um, meme and, and video producers for Trump. And he's also recently been banned from Twitter. Benny Johnson, the creative director for Turning Point USA, TPS USA, launched Professor Watchlist in November 2016. The website names professors it claims advance a radical agenda in lecture halls and promote leftist propaganda in classrooms. Then um, Sebastian Gorka, which is up, up, he is up here at the top pointing his finger, and he serves at, he served as the deputy assistant to the president from um, 2017 to 20 to uh, uh, January 2017 to August 2017. It was a, reported that Trump had plans to appoint him as the National Security Educational Board in in July 2020, but it's not sure what I'm not sure what happened to that. Um, we all know Donald Trump, so I'm not going into detail on him. Um, Charles Kirk is the very last one. He's the founder of Turning Point USA during 2012, and which I had already mentioned that Benny Johnson is the creative director of that. Um, he claims to maintain an on-campus presence of over a thousand colleges and universities. Okay, Jenna, thank you. I'm ready to switch to the architect. Okay, so this is called The Architect because that's what um, uh, many articles that I read refers to uh, Stephen Smith as the architect uh, behind um, the, uh, the, the our, our immigration issue that is going on and um, a separation of the families, all of the little intricacies that are happening with that. So the first person to the left is Carla provost and this one i am going to have to look at a little bit more just i know their names but i have a hard time with their positions so she was the first warm woman to serve as the u.s border patrol agency chief and one of the longest to serve in the the trump administration she retired after admitting that she was a member of the secret facebook group for border patrol officers that were using the site to, uh, to post tasteless and improper racist and sexist posts concerning migrants. Um, below her is Thomas Holman. He um, was a former acting director of ICE and retired from public services, now a, a Fox News contributor, was considered abusive in carrying out um, ICE policies with detainees. And the key word in all of all of these characters is acting. Oh, is that the end, Jenna? I, it went away. Sorry, oh. Sandy. Oh, okay. <laughs> okay, so then, um, then above, um, Thomas Holman is Mark Morgan. He served as the head of Border Patrol and succeeded Roland Vitiello as acting director for heading Immigration and Customs Enforcement. So Trump wants to keep everybody as acting, according to all the articles that I read, because that gives him more freedom of control and can move people in and out. That's why the image in the background of the musical chairs, um, because it's referencing um, just moving people in and out so quickly. Uh, and it's hard to keep control of. Congress doesn't have control of it. Senate doesn't have control. We're not appointing them. He's appointing them. Um, then um, Kristen Nielsen, uh, one of several retired Homeland Security secretaries who served from 2017 to 2019. Before Homeland Security, she also worked for John Kelly as an advisor guiding for the nominees for the Senate confirmation, but she, she also worked in the Bush administration. And her most notable contribution to all this was she oversaw most of the Trump administration's family separation efforts. 
Then um, above her is John Kelly, previously served as Secretary of Homeland Security and Chief of Staff of President Trump. Stephen Miller, who is what this is named for, the architect is next. Trump's senior policy advisor and considered the architect of Trump administration's immigration plan, previously was the aide to the Alabama Senator Jeff Sessions. Jeff Sessions is right behind Trump. And he, again, is the Alabama Senator, senator who became attorney general for the Trump administration early in 2018. Sessions announced that the Department of Justice would institute a policy of zero tolerance, tolerance for undocumented immigrants. Donald Trump, again, in the center, I'm not going to concentrate on him. Um, Ronald uh, Vitiello, which I'd already mentioned, um, who someone else had replaced, is behind Trump in the uniform, and he served as acting director for the head of Immigration and Customs Enforcement. Then he received a nomination to be submitted to the Congress for a permanent head of Immigration and Customs Enforcement, only to find out that Trump, Trump receded his nomination because he decided that it was better to have people acting and not in permanent positions. Then the person walking across towards the bottom is Kevin McElhaney, McAleenan, um, and he was the former head of CBC, Custom Border Patrol. Then he followed Kristen Nielsen um, as the acting Secretary of Homeland Security. Trump preferred to maintain the musical chairs game of acting, um, which I already mentioned. And then um, above him is John Sanders. He served as the acting Customs Border Patrol Commissioner and quit after only two and a half months. And the very last one is Matt um, Amblance, who served as de de Deputy Director of ICE, currently serving as actor, Acting Director uh, of U.S. Immigration and Customs Enforcement since July 2019. And that's, that's what I have. Thanks, Sandy. Wow, uh -huh. that is quite a list of people. Uh -huh. <laughs> um, so I have, I have one question for you. Um, uh -huh. I know that creating these collage works took a long time and you spent a lot of time um, with the images of these people. And I'm just wondering how that kind of invaded your psyche as you're working on this piece and working with the paper dolls? Um, that's, that's a really good question. It horribly, it's affected me very bad. I'm still actually very much struggling with it. Yeah. And I, another thing that I did was uh, a part of this investigation that I was doing and, and research was I had a Twitter account, but I really wasn't using it. So I really started using that and Oh, and I fell into a black hole. It's bad. <laughs> I'm still in there. <laughs> so I take it you're not watching the debates tonight. <laughs> right. Well, I probably will, but um, I don't know when they start. Um, well, thank you so much for going through that because we have had lots of questions about who people are. We need to have a map, but... Um, yeah, so, I'm sorry. I meant to have I meant <laughs> to have text that was going to happen, but I ran into so many problems with making the work that I never got there. I have it. No. I have it all written down. Just never got there. Well, no problem. Just it's it is a really fantastic piece. You did a really good job with the digital um, collage and just making it making it so seamless. It's fantastic. Um, Thanks. Although they're not my favorite people to look at. <laughs> yeah. No, I know. Um, so I'm, I'm again today having trouble seeing the chat. So I'm going to ask Jenna to just look in the chat and tell us if there are any questions or comments that we, the audience would like to share. Well, we have one comment from Susan Goldstein. Um, uh, let me see. I, I believe she says Acosta, the Secretary of Labor under Trump, 
and connected to the case against Epstein, if she remembers correctly. Oh, yeah. He was the one you yeah, forgot. I blanked on his position and wasn't finding it in my notes. So thanks, Susan. Yeah, thank you. Well, um, we're running a little bit over, so I'm just going to move on. If, uh, if any questions come up for Sandy, please put them in the chat and then we will, we could revisit um, any questions. But for now, we'll move on. Thank you so much, Sandy. That was really informative. Thank you. Bye. Bye. I'm not going to be here. I'm just going to turn <laughs> Don't off. Don't go away. Okay, and so now I am happy to introduce our next speaker. Um, we have Summer Ventus with us. Summer's work uses the printed surface to address internal and external landscapes and their intersections. The imprints we leave on each other and our surroundings and the imprints that our surroundings leave on us. She received a BA in art from Grinnell College and an MFA in printmaking from the University of Colorado Boulder. Her work has appeared in national and international exhibitions and is held by collections, including those of the Denver Art Museum and Proyecto ACE, I'm sure I mispronounced that, in Buenos Aires, Argentina. She is a member of the Colorado-based collectives Hyperlink, as well as the Art Knots, and of Sacramento-based Axis Gallery. She is Assistant Professor of Printmaking at California State University, Sacramento. Summer, please join us. Turn on your camera and microphone. Hello. Hi, Summer. Can you see me? <laughs> we can see you. Thanks so much for being here. Thank you for having us today. Um, so is Jenna sharing my, my PowerPoint or should I share? There goes Jenna right now. Great. Thank you, Jenna. Um, so first, thank you, Cecily, for curating this exhibition um, and for inviting us to speak here today. And also thank you, Jenna, for coordinating things. Um, so as Cecily said, um, I frame my work in terms of the idea of internal and external landscapes and their intersections, um, the imprints that we leave on each other and our surroundings and that our surroundings leave on us. Um, and if you'll go to the next slide, Jenna. Thank you. Um, so this is my piece in the Walls Between Us exhibition. Um, and I'll talk more specifically about that piece a little later. But I was really pleased to be invited to participate in this exhibition because increasingly I think about those intersections, um, those meeting points between us and each other, between us and our surroundings in terms of boundaries and barriers, which are, of course, synonymous with walls. Um, so how those barriers act as modes of separation, yes, but also as points of connection. And the tent form, which you see here, um, that reflective tent form and the photo piece that accompanies it on the wall across from it are my work, um, in case that's not clear in this image. Um, the tent form is really emblematic of this phenomenon for me, because what is a tent? It's an object that allows us to get out into the landscape to connect with our surroundings by separating and protecting us from them. So with that in mind, I'm gonna to focus today on that idea of the tent form and the different ways it has manifested itself in my work um, and just how it's intersected with other ways that we connect and interact with each other and with the landscape. So if you'll go to that next slide, Jenna. Thank you. Um, so this piece is the first tent form that I made, um, and it's entitled Controlled Burn Enclosure. Um, it's part of a body of work called Controlled Burn, um, obviously referencing the burned landscape. Um, and this is kind of the essence of a tent to me, this, um, this piece of paper suspended from two points and then pulled out so that it forms a little kind of makeshift shelter. Um, and, and this, um, again, arose through my thinking about another medium through which we connect with the landscape, 
um, fire, but specifically the act of controlled burning. And I first learned about controlled burns in the prairie landscape of the Midwestern United States when I was an undergrad at Grinnell College. Um, prairies need fire to exist as prairies, right? If um, without fire, prairie seeds don't germinate. Um, also trees will take over that landscape and it will cease to be the grassland that makes it a prairie. Um, and before settler colonization, a combination of fires started by lightning strikes and controlled burns by indigenous people maintained the prairie in that state. Now that we've broken up the prairie and fires are suppressed, that landscape needs human intervention more than ever to maintain its natural state. In the West, different but related relationships um, exist between people, fire, and the landscape. So in the Midwest, controlled burns are used primarily to protect the landscape from people, to protect that, that prairie ecosystem from our interventions. In the West, they also protect people from the landscape. So as we see, unfortunately, with increasing frequency and right now, um, as we speak, those wildfires are burning. Um, because, me because of many years of fire suppression, a wildfire can devastate not only the forest itself, but can threaten homes and lives in ways that prairie fires rarely do. So in this piece, I was thinking about those ways that we use fire to protect ourselves from the landscape, but also to protect the landscape from our damaging interventions. And if you go to the next slide, that is just a detailed shot of the found stones that create the structure of this tent form. And if you go to the next slide, this work, um, which is called Fire Maps Projection, looks at landscape also through the lens of fire, but it also incorporates some other things that are important to my conception of landscape and our relationship to it. Um, so this piece consists of a similarly constructed tent form um, those two suspended points and then the, the found stones holding the shelter um, open. And then it also has a series of 85 hand printed slides that are projected onto it. And you can see the projector in this slide. And Jen, if you'll go to the next slide, you can see um, that projection onto the tent form. So in The Poetics of Space, uh, Gaston Bachelard says, outside and inside are both intimate. They are always ready to be reversed. If there exists a borderline surface between such an inside and outside, this surface is painful on both sides. And that idea um, of that surface that's painful on both sides um, that idea of the boundary between self and other as that kind of borderline surface is really important um, throughout my bodies of work. And projection, I think, is a really um, powerful kind of visceral manifestation of that borderline surface that's painful on both sides. So you can, you can really see um, kind of the idea that um, that you are seeing something from one perspective, either from the inside or from the outside, but you're also very aware that there is that other perspective. Um, and that also allows us to, to really viscerally experience something that is inherent to most printmaking processes, which is reversal. Um, and, and what I think of as kind of the essence of printmaking is something touches something else and leaves a mark. And the illumination of that projection allows us to see both the difference and the sameness between inside and outside. So that, that reversal, um, that, that similarity and that difference between the perspectives that we have and the perspectives that others might have. If you'll move to the next slide. This is just another view of, um, of another one of those projected hand printed slides on that tent surface. 
And the next slide is um, fringe landscapes searching for a better grassland. So in this piece, the tent form is printed with a representation of the landscape. Um, it's kind of an abstracted grassland that I think can read alternately as a prairie or as one of the agricultural grasslands that have replaced much of that prairie. So if you think about it, um, so much of, of agricultural land is actually grassland. A cornfield is a grassland in rows. A pasture is a manufactured grassland for livestock. Um, and, and for me anyway, and, and I imagine um, if people have, have gone and seen a tall grass prairie, like in a prairie preserve, um, it's an overwhelming landscape. It's easy to imagine how settlers arriving in that landscape would be afraid of it, would want to, to domesticate that, um, that space into, into a different grassland. Um, but now that so much of that landscape is taken over by these agricultural grasslands, we see the kind of terrors of that version of the grassland as well. So um, the dangers of agricultural runoff, um, the threat of monoculture. And, and so with these tent forms, I'm thinking about that kind of changeable nature of our relationship to these landscapes, how either one of these grasslands always potentially contains our longing for the other grassland that it could be. And then there are a few more slides of different views of um, this particular piece, and you can just go through those. This is um, displayed, that same piece displayed in a different space um, at the Turner Print Museum in Chico. Um, and I think it's nice to see kind of the, the difference that that different um, environment and that different lighting brings uh, to this piece in particular. And if you keep going, I think there are two more pictures of this install. Um, and then we're on to the next piece, which is the piece that is um, a part of this exhibition. Um, so Wilderness Reflections is a series that's, um, that's ongoing. And um, in this series, the tent form is covered, or in this case, consists of just reflective mylar, which is semi-transparent. So if you were sitting inside of this tent form, you could see the landscape that surrounded you, but only vaguely. So the primary thing that you would see is your own reflection. And the whole idea of wilderness is, of course, a fallacy, a failure to see completely that which surrounds us. The idea that the natural world exists apart from people, as we were talking about in talking about fire, is an erasure of the indigenous people who lived on this land before it was the United States. And the reflective tent is, for me, a manifestation of that, the way that we look at our surroundings and each other and often only succeed in seeing our own reflections. So this is um, a version of this work installed at Lewitt or Mount St. Helens when I was there on an artist residency. And if you go to the next slide, you can see it installed in a gallery setting. And I think in a gallery setting, it becomes um, more focused on our interactions with each other um, as opposed to in the landscape where it's more about that kind of perception of, of wilderness and, and the lie that that can be. If you'll go on to the next slide. So um, I forgot to include an image of it, but I've been I've been making um, some two dimensional versions of so images of those three dimensional tent forms. And then also this is another sort of tent form. Um, if you look at it from this perspective that I've been working on recently. And if you want to go to the next slide, 
And then um, if you press the arrow one more time, that should start the video on this slide. Um, so this, this piece, alternative greetings, alternative meetings, um, I made this soon after quarantine started as a way of imagining how the barriers that we have necessarily put up in response to COVID very correctly might serve as points of connection with rather than estrangement from each other. So this zine is a series of alternative greetings arising from that imagining. And that has been a really wonderful thing amidst the horrors of this time um, is finding those ways to connect across distance. So I'm grateful to get to do that with you all today. And I'll let that um, the rest of that video play. But um, once it finishes, that's that's what I've got. Thanks, y'all. So, Summer, I have a question. This is Kristen. I work for the CVA as well. Um, I, it's kind of a two-parter. First, I want to say my favorite element um, is that you can't avoid your own reflection when you're looking at the tent in the gallery. Yeah. Uh, makes me really think about that, uh, the correlation and separation also between self and perceived self. Um, which I think is also like a sense of pain that we feel as well. Um, but my question is, your evolution of methods to erect the tent seems very intentional and, or, and based upon concept representation. Can you explain your evolution from cable to wooden crossbars? Um, I think, so it's, I, I started out just wanting to have this kind of essential tent form. Um, and in a lot of ways, the wooden structure is a practical innovation um, because I wanted it to be a little more mobile. Um, part of it arose from installing that tent form um, in the landscape at Lewitt or Mount St. Helens um, and finding that I was constrained to a place where I could suspend that that freestanding bar. Um, and so the the wooden structure allows the tent to stand on its own, um, which I think um, allows it to have kind of a different presence in whatever space it occupies. That makes total sense. Thank you. Thank you. So Summer, thank you for that talk. It was really interesting and I loved the, um, your, how you brought in your influences and that video that you shared um, was a really cool um, peek into another aspect of your practice. Um, so one thing I just wanted to make a comment on is that one thing I love about this exhibition is the very different interpretations of the theme of walls. Mm -hmm. um, you know, 38 different, very different interpretations. And um, I love that you are doing that by looking at this thin barrier between um, between things separating us or connecting us, the internal and external or interior, exterior, and using the tent as a wall. And what's so interesting is that the tent also has missing walls. Mm -hmm. um, you know, the two ends that don't have walls on them. And that really plays to what you were saying about that disappearing, that um, 
the boundary between our surroundings and us. And I, I just wonder, um, have you spent time in these structures that you've built? I mean, they are kind of small, but right. um, <laughs> yeah, like, have you, have you experienced being in these tent forms that aren't fully tented? Yeah, I mean, I, I definitely thank you for noticing those, those open ends and, um, and they are there. Um, you point out that the tent forms are quite small. Um, and, and that is, um, at least partly on purpose because I want people to focus more on that idea of the inside and the outside and kind of the imagined ability to be either inside or outside, but not to really be able to spend time um, <laughs> on on that inside space, if that makes sense. Um, and also those open ends, I think for me kind of point to the the fallacy of the idea that we can protect ourselves from our surroundings, right? It's just another way of emphasizing the ways that that barrier between what is us and what is not us is actually quite permeable. Yeah, absolutely. I mean, I keep imagining seeing a person laying down in that tent with like their feet sticking out one end and their heads uh -huh. <laughs> sticking out the other end, turning it into a performance. Yeah. They, they are um, quite attractive to small children, I have found, so. <laughs> oh, I'm sure. <laughs> a little dangerous, but um, but yeah, it's mostly I see people stick their heads into them um, and um, maybe take a selfie. <laughs> Those reflective surfaces are very, uh, very attractive for that, um, which is a whole other kind of funny aspect, but, but yeah. Yeah, we've seen a lot of selfie taking with your tent in the CVA space. It is really um, compelling, though, because of the reflective surfaces. So when you're looking at it, you see all the surroundings reflected, and you see yourself inside the tent. And mm -hmm. then you also see beyond the tent, which is really interesting. Well, thank you so much for joining us tonight. It's really great to see your face and connect your face to your artwork. Thank wonderful you. to have you that's what's so great about having these online talks yeah i really appreciate you inviting us to do this this is great thank you wonderful well thank you and um i'm again i can't see the chat so kristen if you see other comments or questions please let us know um but i will now introduce our next artist pamela beverly quigley um, Pamela started with the Art Knots in 1996. She developed her visual voice while earning a BFA in printmaking from the University of Colorado Boulder. Her screen prints, monoprints, and experimental pieces involved layering of hand-drawn imagery on non-conventional substrates such as steel and fabric that resulted in large artwork panels and installations. The body of work that developed during these early years led her to graduate studies where she began layering photography and digital processes into her printmaking. Her most recent body of work is a continuation of this journey as she works in mixed media, incorporating oil painting, photography, drawing, and ephemera into her paintings. Layers are intentionally revealed or obscured in order to convey the feeling of the abstracted quality of memory and time. Beverly Quigley continues to exhibit her work both nationally and internationally. She has taught art and design at the University of Colorado Boulder, Weber State University, Utah, and has been an invited guest lecturer at academic institutions, including the American Institute of Graphic Arts, the Institute of American Indian Arts in Santa Fe. Her work has been featured in a variety of publications, including The Lure of the Local by renowned writer and art critic, Lucy Lepard. So with that, I would love to welcome Pamela. Pamela, if you're here, please turn on your camera and microphone and you can take it away. Thank you so much. Can you hear me? We can hear you. Okay, awesome. So thank you for all the hard work you guys have done to put together this show. When I got the photos, and saw what, uh, the images on the website. I was just really impressed. It's a beautiful space and you guys 
did such an amazing job curating the show and installing everything. So thank you. Um, okay, so my piece consists of five birch panels that um, that are side by side on the wall. If you haven't been to the gallery to see them, and um, I don't need, uh, you know what, can you take that slide down just for a minute? Because I'm going to talk about concept and then I'll talk about process. Sorry. <laughs> Thank you. Um, okay. So when I started thinking about the work I wanted to create for this show, I, I was thrilled actually by the, by the title and uh, because it was open-ended and allowed me to consider what aspect I wanted to talk about when it comes to walls. And it led me to a Robert Frost poem called The Mending Wall that I won't read to you, but you can look it up. And it's two neighbors walking on each side of an exterior, you know, stone wall, I think. And they're discussing repairing the wall, although there's nothing on either side to keep in nor to keep out. And I thought that was really um, sort of a timeless message right now with the, with the discussion of a wall being built to the south of us and then a long history of walls, not, not just physical, but also psychological. And I think we've seen a lot of that um, come to a head over the last number of years. So I wanted to create a piece that, that would address that. So, uh, so what I did was I worked on the psychological aspects in a very interpretive and visceral way on my piece and um, combined that with um, using metal from building supplies actually to create uh, the, uh, the bottom layer of these pieces. And I'll talk about that in a second. I wanted to read this quote. I have this really great book that I would recommend everyone get. It's called Walls, A History of Civilization. Can you guys see that? A History of Civilization in Blood and Brick, and it's by David Fry. And it's a little dense, but I've, I have found so much, so much interesting content in there, and I wanted to share this one um, excerpt. It says, worldwide, some 70 barriers of various sorts currently stand guard over borders. Some exist to prevent terrorism, others as obstacles to mass migration or the flow of illegal drugs. Nearly all mark national borders. By some cruel irony, the mere concept of walls now divides people more thoroughly than any structure of brick or stone. For every person who sees the wall as an act of oppression, there is always another urging the construction of newer, higher, and longer barriers. The two sides hardly speak to each other. So that line, the two sides hardly speak to each other, that really resonated with me because I wanted to create a piece that in itself is a wall. It's, you know, 150 some inches wide when you add up all the panels. And, um, and, I, and within that, I wanted people to kind of come close and then step away and interact with this piece that was created in this very visceral manner. So if you'd like, you can go to the slideshow now and I'll talk to you a little bit about process. Thank you so much. Okay, so that first slide, you see uh, a stack of papers and what I did, what I do uh, on some of these uh, panels is I apply different kinds of ephemera, different types of paper, newspaper clippings that maybe have to do with the subject. Like I had some stuff about um, some political things that were going on, some economic um, clippings, and I put all those underneath the painting with these what I call rust prints. So let's see, maybe switch to the next slide. Okay, so here you can see on the left that I've taken all these objects that are, that are made of steel and I use a printmaking process, sort of, <laughs> to transfer rust from the metal objects onto paper and I use different kinds of paper. And I had construction, I had like nuts and bolts, I had, um, uh, heavy-duty construction staples, nails, 
um, all kinds of just metal objects that I turned my garage into my print, the floor of my garage during the self quarantining became my studio because I pulled everything out of my studio and brought it home. And uh, I had I made all these papers with these rust prints. I then collaged them onto the panels, and that's where I apply. Um, I applied some color, and uh, let's you can see kind of the the textured paper with the white lines in it. I, there's certain papers that allow you to see and re reveal some and cover up some of the um, imagery underneath. So maybe go to the next slide. So here you can see um, the five panels and how I began to work. And the reason this is important to me and I wanted to show you this is conceptually, I really wanted to talk about the construction and how much uh, energy and materials and even now, you know, uh, down on the, the border, but just how much energy and materials have been put into building walls. And although the earliest walls that they can date are back uh, uh, to 2000 BC, it, that's crazy. That's the earliest that they've been able to date, but they believe there are walls much older than that. Um, they uh, most of the most of the walls, of course, uh, the prehistoric walls were, or not prehistoric, but the the ancient walls were uh, made of stone, and so they act as timelines. And this is sort of a timeline also, where I have um, imagery moving you from one panel to the next, so that your eye moves from the left to the right. So go to the next panel. Or the next slide, thank you. So the next aspect is to apply um, an encaustic wax on top. And what this does for me is it seals everything below and allows me to take all these different textures and sort of unify them. And here you can see, I have an encaustic studio. You can see the image on the left. I'm starting to apply some of the encaustic wax. Okay, next slide, please. And then this is just close up. So after I apply the encaustic, I then start to paint on the panels. And here you really start to see where encaustic and the cold wax medium I use sort of come together. And, um, and the, the lighter images are, the lighter textures are primarily the, um, the oil with cold wax medium and then the dark blue sections and some of the rusted sections are encaustic. So in this process I'm really into with all my work revealing some things and then often I'll scrape away to get to something that I've covered up and then I'll cover up things and, and for me this discusses the um, sort of the psychological underpinnings of how we put up walls against one another whether it's or the other, I should say. And so as you get closer, you'll see that I've incised really thin lines and you pull back and there's thicker lines that could act as borders or boundaries. And then there's little sections where the metal materials are coming through. Next slide, please. This is an installation shot just to show how it looks in the gallery. And here you can see that, um, that I've worked to have one line lead to the next and formally move you through the uh, five panels. I, if, I, if transportation would not have been an issue, I really envisioned this filling an entire wall, but moving these things can be a little bit challenging. And is there one more maybe in there? And this is just one of the installation shots. And I love the way it looks on this large wall. And uh, it actually looks small compared to it, how it looked in my studio. But, um, but uh, yeah, I think that's pretty much all I wanted to say. I think that, um, that the opportunity to show work, that show my work and have people interact with it and read what I had to say about it and all of that was just a really nice um, sort of a nice gift during 2020 when I was spending a lot of time in my studio, but not really getting out much. So thank you very much.
Thank you so much, Pamela. That was really fascinating to see the different steps in the process. Um, I didn't realize the the all the steps you took. The rust prints were just so stunning. And then to see each step along the way is really, really cool. Thank you. Um, yeah. So I, I mean, I know artists and myself, when I've made art, a lot of times I feel like how do you know when to stop when those rust prints look so gorgeous? And then as you layer it, I love the, the end product as well, but um, when there are so many different processes involved, it can be hard to know when to stop or how, how much farther to go on. So how do you navigate that? That's a really, actually a really good question. I think a lot of artists ask themselves that every day, right? Uh, I think in this particular case, it was it was hard to cover up some of the rust prints and but I wanted the conceptually I wanted the underpinning of these five panels to be about the construction of walls the construction you know that kind of physical tangible aspect and then there's this piece that that I can't tell you what it looks like that I wanted to put on top of those rust prints that has to do with psychology and like how do we how do you talk to people on both sides of the fence which is something that's always really fascinated me and interested me so you know how do you talk to people about the wall in the south or the 70 walls that have gone up around the world you know and and, and uh, what it does to the people on the inside what it does to the people on the outside so i just kept layering this kind of you know soft palette that really was intended to be kind of my my psychological color palette of right of uh, of you know just what I feel and what I think and how do I how do I get somebody who absolutely believes there needs to be walls right how do I get someone to interact with my piece and think differently. So I wanted to, so I kept standing back across the garage. Oh, my husband was so mad because I took over the whole garage. <laughs> and, but it was great. In the end, he was fine. But I, um, I kept going, you know, back to the back of the garage, looking across the room. And then I wanted at every step for there to be something that caught your eye. So as you moved away, you would see the larger pieces. I had the larger rectangles or lines. I had a couple people come by the studio, the garage studio, and say that they felt um, that some of those darker um, geometric forms seemed like windows or doors. And I really liked that analysis of it. I wasn't thinking that when I put them in, but I really liked that idea, creating a window or a door for someone to see something differently. Yeah, I would agree. I thought, I have thought about the architectural elements mm -hmm. um, of the work, and then it also could function as somewhat of a topographical map. Yeah. So you see like the boundary lines crossing from one panel to the next. Mm -hmm. So there's boundaries within the boundaries, which is, mm -hmm. is really interesting. It makes for a very compelling piece. Thank you so much. Thank you. Yeah. I really love having that work in the gallery. Um, and I love that you showed an installation shot. I hope that um, everyone in the audience will get a chance to see the exhibition, but if not, Me we too. will be posting more images as well. Um, so Kristen, I would just ask if you could check the chat for me since for some reason I cannot see the chat again. Yep, we do have um, a couple of questions and one is from uh, Dimas Nunez. What was the Robert Frost poem that you mentioned? It's called The Mending Wall and it's, um, it's a great poem that just highlights this belief that good fences make great neighbors or great fences make good neighbors. And, you know, that's such an antiquated belief system, especially in a world where the population is growing, people are living in higher density communities. And, you know, I think that it's a great poem to bring out of the, uh, you know, the old books, old poetry books. Absolutely. And then just one more question. Um, it's actually my question. This was a stretch from the typical art knots format. Um, how did you feel about the switch and the opportunity to go big? 
Well, I love to work big and I would work even bigger if somebody would let me, but, um, yeah, I, I really enjoyed working large and I felt like I was able to satisfy how I thought about what I wanted the piece to do and then actually what I felt it's doing by, you know, by having this large format, you know, the same thing on an eight by 10 would not really, you know, it's hard to work small, really. <laughs> I think it's hard to work small. Yeah. Well, thank you so much again. It's um, great to hear from you and hear about your process and um, all about your work. So thanks for joining us. Thank you. Thanks for everything. Okay, so on to our last speaker of the evening, um, Doris Arajo. Araujo's love for art started at the early age of six when she discovered the incredible joy of drawing and painting. She started by immersing herself into many children's workshops in her hometown in Colombia, where she experimented with oil pastels, colored pencils, and watercolors, moving into other mediums until finally deciding for pastels and printmaking, which are now her favorites. After graduating from high school, she moved to Florida and continued her artistic career enrolling in the Art Institute of Fort Lauderdale, graduating in 1993 with an associate's degree in advertising design. She continued her studies at Lynn University, where she earned her Bachelor's of Science degree in graphic arts, and in 2015, her artistic passion led her to acquire a Master's of Fine Arts in Visual Arts from the Miami International University of Art and Design. Doris Araujo is an active artist, professor, and studio resident in the Pembroke Pines, Florida, and she has been an Art Knot since 2018. So oh, I welcome Doris. It's wonderful <laughs> to meet you. Thank you Hello. for joining How's us. How's everybody? <laughs> So good, so good to see you. So I will let you take over and looking forward to hearing all about your work. <laughs> Thank you. Um, well, I, I wanted to share um, a PowerPoint that I have, but this is my first time in Google Meet and I, and, and, and I don't know how to share. Can you tell me how can I share um, a PowerPoint? Sure. Uh -huh. So at, um, at the bottom of your screen, there should be a bar that has like the red dot. It's a timer. There's a video mute. And then the next button is a rectangle with an arrow. It says open share tray. Yes. So if you click that, you should be able to select the PowerPoint or however you have your presentation. Oh, I see it, but it's completely blank. It's, uh, it's completely black. Oh, when you click it, it just shows a black yes it's a black bar um, is there any other way to share something well mm -hmm. let's see if you that's mm -hmm. odd i don't know what that means um yeah. if you want to set, shoot it in an email really quick we can put it up uh, okay um, let me let me uh send it to jenna yes okay i'm sending it to jenna right now i'm sorry about this is my first time here and i I did send something, but I don't think, uh, I don't think he's, uh, okay. There you go. Uh, Miles Jennifer, there she goes. I yeah. sent, I just sent it to her. So okay. she should so, be, she should be having it like right now. Okay. It may just take a minute for that to. Yeah get delivered. Oh, <laughs> yes, it's probably going to take a second. Um, it's actually on a keynote. Yeah, and is there any way I can share my screen as well, maybe? Well, that's the only way I know how to do it is through that open share tray. Okay. Unless, Jenna, you have any other suggestions? Yeah, because I'm doing it and I keep on doing it and I just get a black, uh, I just get a black one, but it just went to Jenna, so hopefully she'll get it right away. Hi, Doris. This is Jenna. I am still waiting on that to arrive. Do, okay. you have, do you have the presentation open on your computer? Yeah, I do. I do. I have the keynote. But it's not showing in your tray. Okay. Yeah, it's not showing at all. And all I see is a, a black bottom and I don't know. Do you see when you open the tray and the black 
um, bar comes up, do you see um, a word, the word browse? No, I don't see anything. It's, it's just open and close the tray. Huh. Yeah, but hopefully Jenna will get it. We'll get the, the keynote right now and she'll be able to open it up. I just found it in my junk box. Give me just a minute. <laughs> <laughs> I just found it in the junk. It's okay. That's fine. <laughs> well, and are so, you in Florida so, right now? Yes, I am. I am. I'm in Florida right now. How are things down there? Were, were you in the path of the hurricane? Uh, no, not really. Like, well, there's always, there's always going on in Florida. I got to tell you that there is not a minute of boredom. <laughs> <laughs> there isn't. Uh, so, yeah, but no, no hurricanes. We've been dodging everything, which is awesome because... Uh, we need to dodge something this year. <laughs> yes, we do. <laughs> Many things we need to dodge. <laughs> oh my God, everything. Yes, I know. I know. So are you teaching right now? Yes, I am teaching. I am currently teaching in Broward College. I, I have uh, one class online and the rest of the other classes are face-to-face. Uh, -face. Um, with all the protocols that go in, um, I, I think we should be fine. Uh, so far, so good. Uh, this is week number four. Um, I haven't gotten any any people getting sick. Thank God for that. And um, so that's pretty much, yeah, that's pretty much uh, how is it going. And, you know, trying to continue to produce work and do stuff. Oh, yeah, Jenna got it. Thank you so Yay. much. <laughs> Yay. <laughs> Thank you. Okay, so I included the work uh, for the I included the work for the show, The Walls Between Us, and um, I actually um, you can go into the second slide so that everybody can see it. Um, my work is um, is very uh, it, I would say is very bright. Um, I usually work in what I call multiples, and because I have been doing printmaking. Um, for some time now, I uh, because and I work with uh, women's issues. I pretty much assign a color to a to a different uh, piece of artwork, as you're gonna see in a second. For the wall between us, though, I created one single print, and it's an embossed print. Uh, Jenna, if you, there you go. Uh huh. It's an embossed print in gouache. Um, I love these embossed prints because it shows, it usually shows uh, the female figure, which is one of the things that I do on my work all the time. Um, <clears throat> I've been doing uh, the female nude ever since I was probably 15 years old. So that was about three years ago. <laughs> that was a joke. <laughs> so um, for the walls between us, um, I am going to... Um, uh, read um, the, the the concept behind it and why I did it. Uh, so I wrote, um, the sea that surrounds me is an emotional representation of a woman that is submerged in all kinds of waters. However, she manages to create boundaries and redirect all circumstances and emotions, creating beautiful invisible patterns in her reality. The chosen colors comprise the emotions that flow around her as she is capable of not only changing their connotation, but also organizing and dividing them as represented by the fine white lines left in the embossed paper. This embossing effect leaves the body clear as well as part of the background, symbolizing the calmness and tranquility of her, of her true soul. Araujo's continuous body of work touches social, cultural, and emotional Women's topics based on the perception of many female models in today's society. And you can see my work um, on my website. I updated my website recently, so you can see all my 2020 um, work. Um, so this is what I tried to encompass in this piece. Um, I just wanted to, um, I felt um, that we were, I was so bombarded uh, with, politics and COVID and this and that and 
it's just it was it just got to me it was a little bit too much it was so much that i had to turn off my tv uh for a week to kind of recap and and actually say okay what what all these means to me and uh that makes with my personal life and how i felt um and and seeing other females around me it just i decided to create something like this and this is why i have um, so my so this is a different kind of walls. These are walls that we put, um, you know, between us and between, um, you know, whatever surrounds us. So that was the piece that I put in for the show. Um, now, Jenna, if you go to the second slide, to the third one, sorry. Now, this one is... Um, this is a print that I did on locked paper. And like I said before, um, to me, in my work, I want to represent the um, message of every single woman because we are so different. Um, but at the same time, we are a force. In my work, when I create multiples, I usually assign different colors to everything, signifying the voice of a different woman. So, you know, the personality of different women is a different color and together we are a stronger voice. And that is the reason why I create multiples, because to me, sometimes saying one, one thing is not enough. You can say, you know, as a stronger voice, many of us, we can actually make, um, you know, we can actually send a message better. Uh, this one is called Misunderstood, and um, it is a woman, as you can see, she is misunderstood. She is looking towards the other side, it's, uh, it's another nude, and, um, and you cannot really tell what she's saying, but she is saying something. Um, and um, it is a letter press on Lock the Paper. Uh, Lock the Paper is uh, from Nepal, and it's one of the, my favorite papers in all my work because um, the, the lock the paper is a paper that is um, done by women in Nepal. Um, and they produce this paper and it's sold everywhere. Um, and they sustain themselves producing this paper. Um, it comes in all colors, so it is perfect for me because not only this paper is done by women, but the message of my work is also sent you know, to everybody from a woman's perspective. Uh, now let me see the other one. The, um, that one is a silk screen um, and this one is called Open. It's another nude as you can see and, um, and this one has the flower on the side. It is also the representation of a woman uh, that to me needs to be a little bit more open. Sometimes we feel that we are as open as we can be um, and that we are you know, getting things from our lives and, and releasing things from our lives. Uh, when in reality, sometimes I feel that we still need to be more open uh, to give and receive. And uh, again, it is different colors, uh, different, slightly different layouts. And um, this is one of the reasons I love pre-making because it allows me to create multiples um, in, in different positions, different layouts, different colors. Um, is the expression of every single female that I want to portray in each piece. Um, and the last piece that I have, number five, uh, this one is a silver point on wood panel. And um, I love silver point. I think uh, the tarnishing with the, with the time uh, produces these, um, you know, beautiful uh, tonalities. Um, we don't see it in the photo so much, but, you know, up close, we could probably see it. This one is called gold and silver, um, and it's just a representation of how much we can shine. Um, so I created this set of nudes, again, just different positions, um, just to see, you know, how beautiful we can be. Uh, so as you can see, my work uh, is, is just a little different as far as um, that it comes out of, of, of the soul, pretty much. I would want to say that. Um, that's pretty much it. So I'm open to any questions at this point.
Thank you so much for that uh, explanation of your work. Um, so we do have questions. I can't see them, so I'm going to ask Kristen to read them. Um, actually, I had a question. Um, when I'm looking at your um, the sea that surrounds me, there's mm -hmm. this big push and pull between positive and negative. Um, mm -hmm. with the, the directionality of your waves and um, the colors. Um, I almost feel like you're submerging as well as like rising above. And I love that about it. Um, <laughs> <laughs> was there some symbolism behind the colors that you chose? Um, I chose mainly warm colors because of the fire with it, because of the power of the warm tonalities. Um, I actually wanted to create another embossed print with cool colors, but I said to myself, no, uh, this coming and going and this ambiguity between, like you said, submerging and emerging, um, to me is, is more of a warm tonality. So that's why I, I use those. Fabulous. Thank you. <laughs> You're welcome. I also noticed with that same work, the sea that surrounds me, that that the waves emanating out, the waves of color that emanate from the figure are like energy waves or, um, you know, sending the spirit out from the figure. And so it's interesting that you spoke of the figure being clear or blank. And I wonder if that's like... Um, an energy field flowing out or something to that effect, or if you would speak about that a little bit. Um, when I do the nude embossed, I usually like to keep it neutral. Um, and then the, whatever surrounds that, um, that embossing um, usually stays, uh, usually is the colorful part. Uh, because at that point, I feel the body is neutral. So that's why I didn't do any color on that. It's just what, what comes in. It's just one solid person. It doesn't have that feel. Uh, Hopefully yeah, I answered the question. <laughs> yeah, yeah. It's very striking to see the difference between the embossing and then the, the paint, mm -hmm. which is so bold coming mm -hmm. out from it. Um, OK, Kristen, do we have any other questions? We do. Trina asks, um, it's, or says, it's great to see your work and you. Um, how does the idea of the multiple work in your prints? Yes, well, um, the idea of the multiples came, um, I would say, a couple of years ago because I was creating uh, this concept of how can, in my work, so many different women um, can be how can we have a voice if we're so different? So I began with one piece um, and, and in, my, in my work, all I see, I see color. Color represents so much to me. So I, I created this piece of artwork and I'm like, every single woman should be represented by a color. And that's the reason why I ended up doing different colors the different colors is the representation of a different woman in my work. Uh, it just it just came in one piece that I did, and uh, when I saw it, I'm like, oh my god! I, I is every single woman has a color, and we are different personalities, and that's how it came about. And from there, I just began, you know, exploding that idea. That's a beautiful concept. I love that. Thank you. Well, um, thank you so much for joining us this evening. Again, it's so fun to have these online lectures where we can bring artists from Florida and California on the same night. <laughs> um, and I'm sure we have some people in the audience who are far afield as well. So I'm just so thrilled to have all of you join us and hear about this um, wonderful exhibition that's up for a few more weeks. And I hope that everyone will get a chance to see it. We, um, we are producing a video and we have some great photos that will be on our website soon. Um, so if you can't see it, you have the opportunity to do that. But um, thank you all so much for being here. Uh, thanks for inviting us. <laughs> Absolutely. Good night. Bye-bye. <laughs>